I mean, I feel like this is I, my show. I feel like you're. I feel like you just kind of rolled into my life. Is that like a wheelchair joke? I'm out of here. How do you work this thing? I'm missing. I'm missing my mark, but I'm going now. Jerk. Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to Fundy Fridays. If you're new around these parts, my partner Jen and I talk about American evangelical Christianity and conservative politics on this channel, and we really try to leave you with a few more laughs at the end of each episode and just a few less thoughts about the infinite oblivion that is our society. Now, before we get too far into this, because this is my Madison Cawthorn update episode, I want to address a problem that happened the last time I made a video about him. I used the term Judeo-Christian, which is not a term I'm very fond of. A few commenters pointed that out to me and I didn't even realize it at the time. I'm so happy that they did though. I want to apologize for anybody that I hurt by using that term and take this moment to make amends as best I can. And I really appreciate people pointing that out to me. Every chance at growth is sincerely appreciated. So thank you so much for giving me another chance at that. So moving on from there, tonight we're headed back into the Sacred Fundy Fridays ring for part two of our Clash of the Clicks update contest. But this time, Time, it's not for the ladies, it's just for men. Yeah! 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 This is the second part of an update episode, which I'm pretty sure is probably the absolute worst place for someone to start out on a new YouTube channel. While this will still probably be a hilarious video because I'm just an adorable little meatball that can't help but tickle your funny bone, I would encourage you to at least go check out part one of this two-part event first, if not the original videos on these subjects. I'm also proud to announce here that in the good old Fundy Fridays tradition of going absolutely fucking ham for Halloween, I will be getting my own Halloween special this year. If you stick around to the very end of this video, you'll get a little teaser about who that episode's gonna be about. Ooh, <laughs> Seriously though, y'all, I am so excited about this, I can't see straight. I've been doing this for almost a year full time now, and I, I just can't believe I made it to my own Halloween special. I know how big a deal this is. I'm not gonna let you down. I'm not gonna let the Reverend down. I'm, I'm taking this so seriously, y'all. I'm taking this just as seriously as, well, as seriously as Casetify takes protecting your phone from drops, plops, and spills. Casetify's the sponsor for today's episode. Right now, I want to take a minute to say thanks to this week's wonderful sponsors over at Casetify. Right now, you can go to casetify.com slash Fundy Fridays to save 15% off your next order of a top quality phone case. Longtime Genonites probably know that Fundy Fridays and Casetify go way, way back. Jen and I have been using their cases for months now, and honestly, at this point, I cannot imagine going back to another phone case company. I have been using and abusing their Cheatech 2.0 shock absorber system for ages now, and my phone still looks and works exactly the same as the day it came out of the box. What can I say? When you're reading articles about Madison Cawthorn and Matt Gates all day, your phone tends to just slip out of your hand every now and then. For example, he said what? And see, look at that. Still good as new. No problems, no breaks, no cracks, nothing. Look, you can even see my home screen. It's Jen. But starting with their iPhone 14 lineup, Casetify is going to offer their new EcoShock protection system, which offers an unbelievable 11 and a half feet of drop protection at five times the military standard. And they've managed to accomplish all of this while maintaining the same sleek, hand-friendly, comfortable design that we're all in love with. For those of you like me with little tiny hands, that's a big deal. And Casetify offers thousands of prints, customizations, options, all kinds of ways for you to personalize your phone down to your exact preferences. Casetify constantly works with new and exciting featured artists to make sure their prints are on the cutting edge of today's trends. Take current Casetify featured artist, the M Jewelers, who specialize in ultra chic minimalist prints for those of us who like to stay cool and mysterious. No joke, I have one of their cases coming in the mail as we speak. You can see it in some of the ones that they've sent me before here. My personal favorite, Brockzilla. 
Peepaw customized. Oh, upside down. I got my Peepaw customized case. I've got my happy palm trees. I had to retire that one because it was making me sad for the summer going away. I've got my Las Vegas plane ticket. My uh, old classroom sticker design. It's a uh, back to school season and it made me a little nostalgic for when I used to get them good grades in school. It just blows me away how many options Casetify really has. I have spent hours going through their website just looking at the cases. They send us cases all the time to do these ads and yet Jen and I are still buying new cases just because we can't keep up with the new selections. And Casetify works hard to make sure that they can bring you the newest top of the line cases in a way that's also eco-friendly and good for the planet. Their new iPhone 14 lineup is going to continue this strong standard utilizing 65% recycled materials for their cases and 100% recycled materials for their packaging. Casetify also continues to offer their Recasetify program, allowing you to send your old cases in for coupons towards the purchase of new upgraded cases, a brand new case, and none of the waste. So whether you're looking to upgrade to the new iPhone 14 or you're just trying to get a nice new set of clothes for the phone you've already got, I cannot encourage you enough to go to casetify.com slash fundy Fridays to get 15% off whatever your next order may be. Whenever you get that new case of yours, you're going to absolutely love it and you're never going to have a more protected phone in your life. Thank you once again to Casetify for sponsoring this video and now back to the action. Now I gotta be honest with y'all, I feel a little bit like DJ Khaled over here with how I'm suffering from success. Last week I was truly blessed to be able to bring all of our lovely Genonites an absolute clickbait combat classic. Speaking of creating YouTube traffic and searches for our beloved Fundy Fridays, Lauren vs. Marge is just a generational political feud that can hardly be topped. That match had everything. Two massive personalities with really complementary skill sets meeting at a magical moment in time for a contest of the ages. Two insufferable sold out mini tyrants throwing down with all the fury that they're terrible little hearts can muster. It was a real Rock versus Hogan moment, you know? And just like Vince at WrestleMania X8, I sort of played my winning hand a little early, I think. Now I'm stuck with an actual main event that can't possibly live up to the five-star classic I just put on, forever dooming my next competitors to a life of being overshadowed and possibly sending a few of you home early to try and beat the traffic. And all this is just to say that Matt Gates and Madison Cawthorn kind of suck compared to Lauren and Marge. You can come down the runway and look like you've stepped off a Rodeo Drive like a goddamn supermodel. I will never look like that. True. You'll never be glamour. I can't promise that tonight's bout is going to have the same quality action and drama that last week's did. And as an entertainer, that just kills me to deliver a subpar product to all of you. I'm not going to, you know, compensate you for anything, but just, you, you know, know that I feel awful. Well, and furthermore, I was at least hoping that this time we'd be able to get our triple threat like we had planned, but it seems that just like last week, another one of our competitors has failed to meet the minimum scandal requirements. Dave Mad Money Ramsey has done absolutely nothing of note since the last time we saw him, all the way back in November of 2021, if you can believe it. The best he showed up with tonight is an endorsement of cryptocurrency, which isn't so much a scandal as just proof of how bad he is at being a financial advisor. He also threw out some very desperate and literal Hail Marys here at the end, trying to appeal to Fundy Friday's religious background, but we just will not budge. Encouraging people to keep tithing even when they're changing churches or going broke? That's not controversial, Dave, that's just stupid. So just like Paula White last week, Dave, consider yourself disqualified. <laughs> Okay, so I know things have gotten off to a bit of a negative start here, but rest assured, your faith in Fundy Fridays will be rewarded. The people who stayed after Rock vs. Hogan still got an all-time classic. They even got an all-time classic women's match that no one remembers because of the sexist booking. I'm talking to Jordan about hikes for lazy people. Oh, wow. So, what are all of you kick-ass Fundy Fridays fans gonna get tonight for your trouble? Only a white-hot slobber knocker, that's all. If you tuned into my previous videos covering Matt and Madison, you know that while they may not have the personal beef Lauren and Marge had, they are still some of the best in the world when it comes to getting good, concerned citizens to doom-scroll their lives away. 
Both of these men are regressive troglodytic windbags whose only hobbies are being utter creeps to women and finding new and creative ways to lick Donald Trump's shoes. Both of them have spent what little time they've enjoyed in the hallowed halls pushing the worst legislation, forging the worst alliances, and in general demonstrating the worst behavior. Worst! Well, last week you saw the GOP's attempt to diversify their image by bringing along the women they traditionally tried to leave at home. This week we're going straight back to their 19th 1980s roots. This is a Reagan approved men's only bout, complete with all the slick back hair and Fabergé egos your little heart could ever ask for. It's gonna be jam packed with so much coke fueled misogyny that by the end of this whole thing, we're all gonna be doing the safety dance. Now, before we send these two boys into the cage to duke it out Washington style, let's take one more quick look at our rules so everyone knows exactly what's about to go down. Just like the ladies, these boys will be competing in five rounds of civic carnage. No special treatment for the men tonight. The objective also remains the same. Act like a complete fool and abuse the trust of the American people to make money for me and Jen. And while you may catch some of tonight's competitors wearing a variety of different neckties, we won't be having any ties in this ring. Only one winner and no participation trophies for the snowflakes. Our winner tonight will receive the admittedly lesser Fundy Friday's Silver Linings Championship, along with an opportunity to inevitably be destroyed by last week's champion Marge at a later date. Also, please note that this is not a comprehensive list, that all opinions are those of the promoter. None of this actually matters or means anything, and there is no possible way any of you will be getting your money back for this foolish event should you decide to attend. Please be nice to me, I'm very sensitive. So with all that out of the way, it's time to bring the competitors out and get this blood sport on the road sport. May I present to you good folks out there in TV land and sitting in the bleachers in my head, Matt Gates versus Madison Cawthorn. <laughs> Round one, stuff I missed in 2022. Now, right off the bat, I gotta say, I was really shocked that any of y'all wanted me to talk about these two again. My episodes on Madison and Matt came out two and five months ago, respectively, and truthfully, I didn't think there was gonna be anything left for me to cover at this point. However, a couple of quick Google searches showed me just how wrong I was about that. Both of these guys have presented me with just a boatload of new scandals, controversies, and debaucheries to go through since the last time I saw either of them. Guess you can't keep a fuck up from fucking up, it seems. Now, in the wake of his primary loss, Madison's recent scandals have centered primarily on his exceptional mismanagement of campaign funds. This was first reported by Roger Solenberger of the Daily Beast just days after my first video about Madison came out, who pointed out some odd expenses related to the now-defeated campaign. With two weeks to go until a primary election he was facing to lose, Representative Madison Cawthorn was already underwater. His campaign held more than twice as much debt as it had cash on hand. The donor well was dry, and he and his staff were months into a madcap spending streak that one campaign source called baffling. And now, after indeed losing that primary, there's no money to pay the piper. Specifically, there's no money to repay the supporters who donated hundreds of thousands of dollars in advance to Cawthorn's election efforts beyond the primary, to the general he now won't be competing in. Cawthorn is required by law to refund those donations. Instead, according to a campaign source, the campaign already spent the money. This person pointed to a spree of frivolous charges over the last year that all accelerated into 2022, such as $1,500 in egregiously frequent trips to Chick-fil-A, almost $3,000 at a place called Papa's Beer, three separate charges at a high-end cigar shop, $21,000 for lodging in Florida, and the big train hundreds of thousands of dollars in sky-high consulting and fundraising fees, including for Cawthorn's friend and campaign manager Blake Harp, who was drawing a salary beyond federal limits. Now, it turns out at the time, this was such an exclusive scoop for Solenberger that not even the Federal Election Commission had access to it. This from Queen City News in Charlotte. A Daily Beast report quoted people who were part of that campaign, saying that the campaign was burning through money and had tapped into a general election fund that it was not supposed to touch. Now, some of this would have showed up in a quarterly campaign finance report, which we're due in July, but Cawthorn's campaign has not submitted anything yet, and they required to in the 
potentially could confirm all of these details. Now, earlier this month, the Federal Election Commission sent a letter to Cawthorn's campaign, basically telling the campaign that they would be fined or could be audited or some sort of legal action could come if they did not release the information. I mean, hey, now, I understand why he was late with that filing, though. He had booked Airsoft with the boys for his birthday weekend, and you can't get that deposit back. Now, Madison would come back from this birthday trip and file his paperwork a full month late, receiving a $17,000 late filing fine for his trouble. But once the documents came down, we all became aware of exactly why he had wanted to hide them for so long. Cawthorn reported Sunday that his campaign had just $1,500 on hand at the end of June, after completely exhausting the $4.2 million he had raised since the start of 2021. Even though Cawthorn contributed $208,000 to his campaign on June 30th, it entered July with $305,000 in outstanding debts, the bulk of which were owed to an LLC owned by his chief of staff, Blake Harp. Now, when the dust all finally settled on this, we were able to see that Madison still owes his donors somewhere in the realm of three to four hundred thousand dollars, despite claiming only fifteen hundred available in the campaign coffers. Now, to put that in perspective, Madison essentially owes the full amount of a 2021 Aston Martin to his donors, while holding in the bank enough money to buy something a little closer to a 2002 Taurus wagon with a bad muffler and a broken tape deck. Madison has also tried to flex a little bit of that I'm still here muscle during his lame duck period since the primary, notably introducing a law to ban federal funding for interstate travel for those seeking abortion care, a law that conveniently already exists on the books. Madison, seriously, just go play with your Robin Hood account and let the people who won their elections do the governing for a little while, okay? Now, Matt, in contrast, has been a very active little scandalman since the last time we saw him running around Fundy Fridays. In my research, he seemed to average about one dominant headline cycle per month since April. Now, for context, I posted my first Fundy Fridays video about Matt on April 15th of this year. Just 12 days later, on April 27th, leaked audio from Capitol Hill showed that several high-ranking Republican members of the House, including Minority Whip Kevin McCarthy and longtime member Steve Scalise, were extremely angry with Matt for what they felt was the incitation of violence following January 6th. From MSNBC, the other thing that we have to do is these members on either whatever position you are calling out other members, that stuff's got to stop, especially in this nature. So I get off right here, I'm, I'm going to call Gate, but anything else we see, don't assume I see everything, don't assume I know everything. Tension is too high, the country is too crazy. I do not want to look back and think we caused something or we missed something and someone got hurt. Um, I don't want to play politics with any of that. Okay, the other thing I want to bring up, and I'm making some phone calls to some members. Um, I just I just got something sent now about Newsmax, something Matt Gates said, where he's calling people's names out, saying an anti-Trump in this type of uh, atmosphere. Um, in some of the other places, this is, this is serious stuff people are doing that has to stop. So I'm calling Gates, I'm explaining to him I don't know how much to say, but I'm going to have some other people call him too. But the nature of what, if I'm getting briefing, I'm going to get another one from the FBI tomorrow. Uh, this is serious shit to cut this out. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, uh, I mean, it's potentially illegal what he's doing. Well, he's putting people in jeopardy. Now, reports indicate that Matt squashed this beef with Steve Scalise, but not before going on Tucker Carlson for just the strangest little clapback. Matt Gates is a Florida congressman. As noted, he was there today. He joins us now. Congressman, thanks so much for coming on. So you were accused by Kevin McCarthy, the guy who is in line to be Speaker of the House, of committing an act of violence by giving your opinion, by saying he was against the former president. Like, is speech violence? What do you make of this? Well, I was just describing the facts. You had a group of people who were going to try to join with Democrats uh, to impeach President Trump, and that is precisely what has played out. You mentioned he's in line to be Speaker. I mean, I, I don't know that Kevin McCarthy's in line to be Speaker. I don't know if the guy could get an account on Truth Social at this point based on the inconsistency between the recordings and what he says to us. Oh, how nice of him to plug his buddy Trump's little tr Truth Social project. Now, don't worry, Matt. I am sure that this year he's going to make sure to include you on 
on the Christmas card list. June would see it come to light through the January 6th hearings that Matt had pursued not only a pardon for himself following the riots, but also for every other member of Congress who voted against certifying the election results. Five days after the attack on the Capitol, Representative Mo Brooks sent the email on the screen now. As you see, he emailed the White House, quote, pursuant to a request from Matt Gates, requesting a pardon for Representative Gates himself and unnamed others. I do feel the need to remind everyone that a pardon does require one to admit that they committed a crime, which seems to be something Matt doesn't realize here. Moving into July, though, Matt would absolutely pounce on the opportunity presented to him by the June 29th repeal of Roe v. Wade to demonstrate his unique brand of shittiness in its most manifested form. Matt made sure to celebrate the repeal by unleashing an absolute acid stream of teen boy insults against his favorite demographic to target, women he doesn't find attractive. Have you watched these pro-abortion, pro-murder rallies? The people are just disgusting. Like, why is it that the women with the least likelihood of getting pregnant are the ones most worried about having abortions? Nobody wants to impregnate you if you look like a thumb. These people are odious on the inside and out. They're like 5'2", 350 pounds, and they're like, give me my abortions or I'll get up and march and protest. And I'm thinking, march? You look like you got ankles weaker than the legal reasoning behind Roe versus Wade. A few of them need to get up and march. They need to get up and march for like an hour a day, swing those arms, get the blood pumping, maybe mix in a salad. Matt would save his most concentrated vitriol for teen activist Olivia Juliana, trying very specifically to target her with his 1.5 million strong base of Twitter followers for the mere crime of pointing out that she is taller than him. Now, unfortunately for Matt, what he didn't seem to realize is that a lot of people are pretty much done with middle-aged white men who make fun of women and teens. He also didn't realize that in trying to pick on Olivia Juliana, what he actually did was piss off an ass kicker who would make him eat those words to the tune of $700,000 in donations in just one day towards pro-choice causes. I also think that in trying to mock someone else for his appearance, Matt seems to have forgotten that he looks like an evil politician decoration you would buy at Spirit Halloween. Harold, you take that shit down, you know damn well the neighbors complained about it last year when their kids started crying. Matt would try and pivot away from his approach in the middle of July, instead opting to try and pit the girls against the gays. Once again, though, he would be smacked down by yet another kick-ass activist, this time Sarah Warbelow of the Human Rights Commission, and during a House Judiciary hearing, no less. From Kelly McClure at Salon. Gates, who the advocate points out has never advocated for LGBTQ rights at any length before, made the bizarre argument that the availability of abortion makes it harder for LGBTQ plus people to become parents. I worry that if the LGBTQ community and advocacy organizations for same-sex couples somehow reorient to be a pro-abortion enterprise, that could actually result in fewer same-sex couples having access to the family formation that gives them fulfilled lives, Gates said to Warbolo during the hearing. Uh, are you concerned about that? Uh, what I would be concerned about is forcing women to carry a pregnancy simply to satisfy another couple's desire to have a child, was Warbolo's response. You know, I have to agree with Sarah on this one, Matt. Speaking as a queer man myself, I feel authorized to say that your state's complete lack of LGBTQIA plus legal protections concerns me far more than my right to commandeer the uteri of others for the purposes of baby production. Matt would round out this scummy summer with a classic GOP hot mic moment. Dutch filmmakers working on the upcoming documentary A Storm Foretold released a 2019 audio clip of Matt reassuring Roger Stone that he would totally get a pardon for all those crimes against democracy he committed and that the big man would never let anything happen to him. Uh, I'm going to go, I'll go down hard though. I'll fight it right to the bitter end. Yeah, but I, I don't think you're going to go down at all at the end of the day. Well, we'll see. We're three weeks from trial. Yeah. I mean, uh, I may have to appeal to the big man because I got, it's the District of Columbia. We surveyed 120 jurors. 90 of them know who I am and they hate my guts. Voluntarily.
I don't think the big guy can let you go down. This is so fucked up. Seriously, someone needs to remind Matt what pardons are, because I think he might just keep admitting to crimes. So wait, no. Don't tell him what pardons are. Never mind. Either way, though, I'm going to have to end up giving this round to Matt. He suitably showed his ass plenty of time since our last video on him, more than enough to keep himself interesting and in the public eye. Using a diverse offense of sexism, squabble, and stupidity, he has shown that I can count on him for at least short-term return traffic to my previous video. On the other side, we know damn well Madison's not going to go to jail or anything over these campaign finance charges, because when does anyone go to jail over campaign finance charges? I'm sure that whatever right-wing news group or lobbying firm that picks him up after all this will just put it on their tab and pay it off as part of his signing bonus. And in the meantime, we know damn well Madison's not smart enough to be writing effective actual bills, so we really just have to wait until he gets out of Congress before we see whether or not we have to think about him or not. And since Matt won't let us forget him right now, the point goes to him. Round 2. Stuff I Missed in 2022. Extremely Creepy. Ah, see? I bet a lot of you thought I was gonna miss a bunch of stuff there. But that's the thing about Matt and Madison. The, the squick is just a central part of both of their characters. We're talking about some old-school, boys' club, dyed-in-the-wool, sex-creep politicos like they had back in the good old days that your grandparents are always going on about. And when you're dealing with dudes like that, you kind of just have to give the sex scandals their own section. Also, RIP to any chance I had of making ad revenue off this video, please buy a phone case, they let me talk about stuff like this. We'll once again start with Madison, because I know darn well a lot of you were waiting for me to talk about this shitstorm in my last video, and I just plum forgot. Honestly, I thought I covered all of his perviness when I talked about the incidents at Patrick Henry College. I'll be the first to admit, I'm as surprised as y'all are that I forgot about the orgy thing, too. The sexual perversion that goes on in Washington, I mean, it, being kind of a young guy in Washington with the average age of probably 60 or 70, and I look at all these people, a lot of them that I, you know, I've looked up to through my life, I've always paid attention to politics, guys that, you know, it, then all of a sudden you get invited to, like, well, hey, we're going to have kind of a, a, a sexual get-together at one of our homes, you should come. And I'm like, what, what, what did you just ask me to come to? Yeah. Uh, and then you realize they're asking you to come to an orgy. Yeah. Uh, or, or the fact that, you know, there's some of the people that are leading on the movement to try and remove, you know, addiction in our country. And then you watch them do, you know, a key bump of cocaine right in front of you. And it's like, wow, this is, this is wild. Okay, now I'm not going to pretend to be some sort of DC insider over here or anything, but I am pretty sure that rule number one of working in Washington is don't talk about the coke orgies. Especially if you're a baby representative with no clout, no friends, and everything to lose. Now, for what it's worth, I do absolutely believe, Madison, that he was propositioned for a sex party by a sitting member of Congress while they were in the middle of a key bump, probably. I mean, we know that Madison lies a lot, but he never gets this creative with it. And besides, we all know they're doing this kind of stuff up there on the hill, right? Please, though, do not get any of that confused for sympathy. If anything, I hope that getting lecched on by his political heroes maybe showed Madison how he he was treating those women back at Patrick Henry. Who knows? Maybe it was their bravery that inspired him to speak out. They're going to take us out into the open ocean. They're going to have their way with us, Mac. we got to get the hell out of here. Is this how you wanted those poor women to feel? No, you know what? I don't enjoy having this conversation with you. I feel like you're lumping me no. in with them. Matt, on the other hand, though, his creepy scandal is a whole different ball of wax from Madison's. We spoke of the CSA and human trafficking investigation that has followed Matt ever since March of 2021. When I made my previous video, I noted that the other key figure in this investigation, former Seminole County tax collector Joel Greenberg, had been arrested and was cooperating with an investigation potentially into Matt himself. What I didn't make clear, though, was that Greenberg himself actually pled guilty in May of 2021 to, among other charges, the knowing solicitation of a minor. Since that time, Greenberg's sentencing has been pushed back several times, with many in the press speculating that this may be related to investigators milking him for as much information as they can into the investigation of Matt and possibly others. But now, Greenberg's sentencing date has been formally set for December of 2022, indicating to many that the investigators are now done with him and ready to move forward with the next phase of the investigation. This whole situation has truly overshadowed every single action Matt Gates has taken as a public figure, and probably any actions he will take throughout the course of his political career. Take, for example, this summer when Matt planned to do an in-person stop at his hometown Niceville High School for an event called Academy Night. 
This is a relatively common tradition, wherein students looking to enroll with one of the country's military academies can easily pursue the required congressional recommendation they will need for the application process. Most of the time for an event like this, an aide would probably go in place of an actual sitting representative, but under more normal circumstances, it wouldn't be terribly uncommon for someone like Matt to want to visit their old stomping grounds, get a couple of photo ops, and take advantage of the moment. However, Matt is such a toxic and troubling figure you're all on his own that many parents in the district weren't even comfortable leaving their kids alone with him and protested the event. Let's hear from yet another kick-ass activist dunking on Matt, this time his local constituent and founder of Women Against Matt Gates, Samantha Herring. Uh, we're an organization that um, basically came together uh, because of the, the issues that um, were brought up with our congressman um, making some really inappropriate, demeaning uh, statements towards women. And as women in the congressional district, we just, you know, had had enough. I'm here because Matt Gates should not be involved with our children. Right now he's under investigation. We have an academy night tonight and he is one of the um, representatives that can refer people for the academy. He is not a good role model. He has also called women thumbs. If there's a little young woman that's a little bit overweight, he may not refer her to be in the academy because of what he looked what she looks like. So I'm here to protest the fact that he's involved with our children at all. Our members, um, many of them are here today, as you can see, have been writing letters to the school board members and to the superintendent. Um, they're extremely concerned about the fact that a sitting United States congressman is currently under investigation uh, for alleged uh, sex trafficking charges and that um, there are events taking place like one here today in Okaloosa County um, with minors involved. And we're asking Congress to listen to us and take action. Um, or better yet, Congressman Gates, hear us. We want you to self-suspend and yeah. step down from the Do the right thing, Congressman Gates. Give these folks peace. Give these folks peace of mind until these allegations are resolved. Now, tragically, Matt did end up getting to move forward with this event, as we see in these photos he so boastfully tweeted after it was finished. At the time, I was really rooting for them to shut this whole thing down, though, man. No teenager should have to spend time with a creep like that. And the thing is, it's not like any of this seems to have made an impression on Matt, either. He's still out here voting against legislation to protect victims of sex crimes like it's his absolute favorite activity in the world. He ain't learned a damn thing. So, I bet you think Matt's probably gonna take this round the same way he did with the last one, right? Just turn on the fire hose of faux pas and just let Madison drown in the cascade of bad influence and general nastiness, right? Well, not so fast. Overplaying your hand with Washington's kinky secrets and losing your congressional seat over it, that's one thing. I mean, it's certainly not going to make you a lot of friends in Congress or with the donors, but it's also not the kind of thing that ends up putting you in prison in the long run. Matt's creepiness, though, very well could end up with him behind bars for a long, long time. These are not the kind of charges that anyone will just forgive and forget, and if he is convicted of them, then it will absolutely be the last we ever hear from Matt Gates. Everyone knows it, and that's why this scandal refuses to die like all the other ones that have surrounded him in the past. And Matt himself is very aware of how serious this is. Just this past week, we all got confirmation of that during the ongoing January 6th hearings. An aide to former President Donald Trump testified to the House Select Committee investigating January 6th that GOP Rep Matt Gates of Florida sought a preemptive presidential pardon relating to the Justice Department investigation examining whether he had violated federal sex trafficking law. A source familiar with the aide's testimony tells CNN. John McKinty, who served as the director of the White House Presidential Personnel Office in the Trump administration, told the committee that Gates spoke to him about the process for seeking a pardon related to the DOJ's investigation in a short meeting. Seriously, I am begging y'all not to tell this man what a pardon is. At this point, I'm kind of expecting him to admit to being the Zodiac Killer or some shit. Did y'all hear that? 
Anyway, so yeah, at the end, what I think here we have is an odd demonstration of bravery from Madison versus Matt potentially having committed one of the most atrocious, horrible things any of us could imagine. I don't even want the kind of engagement that Matt's behavior is going to bring. Whereas now, I am fully convinced that, if nothing else, Madison certainly has the audacity to keep himself in the headlines for a long, long time. Madison takes the point, and we're tied back up at one. Round three combat proficiency, or lack thereof. Yes, we are going to switch things up from last week's contest and put the traditional trial by combat here in the middle, rather than at the end where everyone probably expected it to go. Mainly, this is because, unlike Lauren and Marge, we don't really have any reason to think that Matt and Madison will get into any kind of fist fight anytime soon, sadly. As a professional purveyor of political plot lines, I am just waiting for Lauren and Marge to snap and spill my violent fanfiction all over the streets of DC. That shit's gonna pay off my student loans, and you better damn well believe them selling tickets to the rubber match, but I'm never gonna get anything like that with Matt or Madison, so what's the point? Now, to be fair, if these two ever did meet up in a combat situation, the winner is already kind of pretty damn obvious, in my opinion. I mean, in this very episode, we've already seen footage of Madison at least attempting to learn proper firearm technique and combat strategy. Hell, just Google Madison Cawthorn guns and you'll find plenty of evidence that he's at least comfortable with a firearm in his hand. Honestly, at this point, I don't really have any concern about Madison in a fight at all. Now, do you know how many pictures of Matt I was able to find where he was holding a gun? You'd think there'd be a few, right? You know, it's kind of a big deal. He's a Republican. I honestly don't entirely know how he would get elected with it. One. One photo. There is one photo of Matt Gates holding a gun. What are we going to do with one? You need two. I mean seriously, though. This single photo that you're looking at right now is it. Just take this shit in, would you? This is high art, on par with any photo ever taken by Leibowitz or Maplethorpe or any of them, and I swear the longer you look at this thing, the better it gets. Matt's pained expression as he tries to pretend this is totally a normal thing he does all the time. These old white folks posing like they're with their grandkids before prom. Lauren, who is clearly enjoying a gleeful fantasy about shooting the cameraman in front of her. This fucking lady, the fuck is she doing? Holy shit, this is an event designed to make Matt look good? Yeah, honestly, this photo tells me everything I need to know about how Matt would fare in a combat scenario against Madison. Hell, at this point, I'm kind of worried about his chances against the kids from Major Pain. At least they learned to fight at the end of the movie. I need y'all to know that I racked my damn brain trying to come up with a single combat advantage or strategy that Matt could possibly use in this situation. And this is the best I could come up with. God give you greatest gift. Big head, like beach ball made of bone. Gives you perfect balance. So I guess it's Matt's perfect balance versus Madison's tactical firearm training. I'm not even going to say who wins this round. Let's just go ahead and move on. Round four, the 2022 election and future political prospects. Well, and just like that, we watch Madison's advantage dry up faster than Ben Shapiro's wife on their monthly date night. I mean, one of the biggest problems I had with this whole episode is, for all the continued notoriety that Madison may still have, he lost his primary, and that does a major blow to his brand any way you slice it. And you may recall that Matt didn't even lose to anyone interesting in the GOP. No, no, quite the opposite. It seems he offended his district's voters so much that they went out of their way to pick the most boring human being they could possibly find to replace him. It's quite a shame, too, since the district was able to pick a pretty solid Democratic challenger for the upcoming election as well. Local pastor, parent, writer, and longtime LGBTQIA plus activist Jasmine Beach Ferrara may not be the flashiest candidate out there, but like Marcus Flowers, she certainly does a good job of bridging the gap between progressive ideology and Southern identity. Some people will say a gay woman who's a Christian minister just can't get elected in the South. Not to mention she's a Democrat. But I say an insurrectionist who flirts with Nazis and fires up a violent crowd to attack our democracy. Wow, this crowd has some fight in it. Well, he shouldn't get reelected anywhere. My name's Jasmine Beach Ferrara, and the truth is I've already been elected in North Carolina, twice. Like a lot of folks in Western North Carolina, I know what it's like to be underestimated and then to beat the odds. I felt a calling, so I got ordained. We took the campaign for marriage equality to small towns all across the South because I believe love wins everywhere 
and every time. Through it all, my faith has lifted me up, especially in the darkest hours. So with all due respect to the skeptics, this barbecue-loving, football-watching, proud Southern mom of three is running for Congress. And you better believe I'm running to win. See, even in that ad, though, you can just tell how much she was banking on running against Madison. Even today, her campaign materials either reference Madison or no one at all, like she's trying to pretend Chuck Edwards doesn't even exist. I really hope I'm wrong, but I can't help but feel like Chuck's victory kind of sealed Jasmine's fate. At this point, the person most expected to benefit from Madison's loss is actually Maxwell Frost, the current Democratic candidate from Florida's 10th district. For reference, Maxwell is an incredible, progressive powerhouse that just took a convincing victory in his local primary and is expected to cruise to victory in his upcoming general as well. At 25 years old, a general election victory would allow Maxwell to snatch the crown from Madison of youngest member of Congress and also let him become the first true member of Gen Z elected to federal office. Kind of giving a children of men thing, don't you think? Oh, and speaking of Florida primaries, let's go ahead and see how Matt did. Well, that's certainly disappointing. Uh, it seems that no amount of potential sex crimes or jokes at the expense of teenagers can break the hold this man and his family have on the district. Seriously, good people of the Florida first. Y you know you're allowed to pick someone other than Matt to be your representative, right? Like, I don't know if someone told you he's the only candidate or something, but th they're lying to you. You really can be represented by someone other than Matt Gates. I know! Now come on, let's at least take a look at his Democratic opponent, shall we? Her name is Rebecca Jones, she also took a commanding victory in her primary, and she does have quite the interesting backstory leading into this election. I was working for the Florida Department of Health, I managed all of our public data systems, and I was asked to do something that was unethical and illegal, and I said no. I didn't flinch, I just said no, and I had no idea that that single action would take me to where I am now. I was told that I had four days to resign in lieu of termination. And on day two, the governor of my state was in front of the vice president of my country defaming me. I know that was a little vague, so allow me to provide a bit more context on what she's saying there. Rebecca was hired by the state of Florida in 2020 to construct their COVID-19 tracking dashboard system. Rebecca alleges that while working in this role, she was directed by Florida government officials to fudge the numbers on Florida's astronomical transmission and infection rates. When she refused, she was subsequently terminated. Not only that, though, shortly following the termination, Rebecca's home was raided by her local SWAT team in what seemed to be a pretty blatant act of retribution on the part of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis. Wow, that is awful. That is objectively awful. I mean, it really is kind of a testament to her courage and determination and sacrifice as a whistleblower. And then to go and use all that knowledge and passion to try and unseat one of the country's worst representatives? I mean, Rebecca's got to be the perfect candidate, right? Right? We all know it's not going to be that easy, is it? No, Rebecca Jones is not the perfect candidate to face Matt Gates this November. In fact, she's far from it, actually, and in my opinion, only marginally better than him at all. Let's go ahead and take a quick trip back to 2016, shortly after Rebecca's termination from a teaching position she held at the time at LSU Baton Rouge. This from the Crime Brief section of the school's Reveille student newspaper. Staff member booked after altercation with LSU PD officers. On June 13th, 26-year-old university staff member Rebecca Jones was booked on one count of battery on a police officer, one count of remaining after forbidden, and two counts of resisting arrest, Scott said. Scott said officers arrived at the C. Grant building when Jones refused to leave at the request of LSU Human Resources. Scott said Jones initiated physical contact against two LSU PD officers while resisting arrest and officers were forced to subdue her. Didn't Lauren Boebert do this exact same thing in a music festival? I tell you, if I had a nickel for every time one of my video subjects ended up in some weird tiff with police over a minor inconvenience... I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Now y'all know me. I'm not the type of guy to take the cop's side in any altercation they have with citizens unless 
absolutely forced to do so. I don't know anything about this situation other than the words I just read, so bear that in mind. But I do know that this is something the SWAT team that raided her home latched onto following the incident. And it's what pushed them to release their own body cam footage, which showed Rebecca and her husband ignoring the knocks of police officers for 20 minutes. And these are just not the kind of mistakes that a Democrat in the South can recover from. People love cops down there. And any credible point of argument they get over a citizen is just going to be treated as ironclad. This type of thing calls Rebecca's credibility into question, and that's something she just can't have happen if she's going to try and take down Matt. It's a really hard kind of scandal to recover from. Speaking of which... You know what other kind of scandal tends to be pretty hard to recover from? A massive, messy, cheating and stalking scandal. Yeah, okay, that transition sucked, but this is just too weird for anything graceful. From Joseph Lambiette at the Daily Mail. A Daily Mail investigation has revealed that Jones, a married mother of two, was fired from Florida State University for having an affair with one of her students, while herself a PhD student and instructor in 2017. The affair which Jones chronicled in great detail in a 342-page essay that she filed as part of the now-dismissed defamation case, ended with three arrests and revenge porn and cyber-stalking cases against her, as well as a claim of pregnancy. The essay, obtained by Daily Mail, includes page after page of graphic details on alleged sexual encounters with then-student, redacted, then-21, as well as X-rated text messages about sexual fantasies both were having about one another. Okay, now please note that that is the very condensed version of this story. This affair for context began in the spring of 2017. Over the course of the next two years, Rebecca would become pregnant by the student, vandalize his car, stalk and attack him on the FSU campus, be charged for those crimes, publish her weird sex memoir along with the student's nudes, and threaten to fail his roommate in another class as a separate means of blackmail. And it's not like this shit is ancient history or anything. This happened five years ago. Rebecca still has charges pending from this case. Good lord, the Florida First just seems to like their politicians the way I like my burritos. Messy, cumbersome, and full of regret. Now, I will obviously say that the crimes Matt is being accused of are far worse than those that Rebecca is being accused of. Call me a bleeding heart, though, but I feel like this district deserves a better choice of representative than who do you think has sent out less revenge porn in their life and whose creepy sex scandal bothers you less. I don't know about any of you, but I wouldn't want either of these two representing me in Congress. And if you live in the Florida first, I would highly encourage you to just write in your favorite Backstreet Boy at this point and try again in 2024. And besides, at the end of the day here, all I've really shown is that Matt's going to win. Unless something cataclysmic happens between now and his November election, Matt is going to beat Rebecca and retain his seat. Even an electable Democrat would have a hard time winning in this district, let alone the cargo jet full of awful baggage that is Rebecca Jones. And in the end, this whole little contest is still about getting me traffic and engagement. Matt can truly guarantee himself headlines and search traffic right now in a way that Madison can't just by being an elected official. Sorry, Madison. It's not my fault you lost to Chuck. Point goes to Matt. Round five. Conservative podcasting. And at last, we arrive here in round five. Just like Lauren and Marge before them, so too have Matt and Madison arrived at a 2-2 tie here in our Clash of the Clicks. I like to believe that this demonstrates how fundamentally these two were never really all that different from one another in the first place. Now that isn't to say that the similarities are as obvious as they were last time. Unlike Marjorie and Lauren, Matt and Madison did not come into the same Congress together and did not share the same minimal amount of political experience when they arrived in Washington. We just can't ignore Matt's significant political advantages over Madison. If we include his time in the Florida House, Matt possesses a full decade of experience over Madison in government, which we can see play out in his more active and competent use of the legislative process. Matt also boasts more familial wealth, 
more political connections, and a much more impressive education, at least for someone with a government job. On paper, Matt wins this contest pretty handily, I think. Likewise, though, we can't ignore the charisma gap either. While Matt came into his elections with enough credentials on paper to convince most disengaged voters that he was at least minimally qualified, Madison really had to ride the personality train to the top of American politics and convince people to vote for him in spite of how bad an idea it seemed to be. On paper, Madison was a guy in his mid-twenties with minimal education, maximum debt, and no real reason to be pursuing anything like public office. And yet, he was able to jump straight into Congress at just 26 years old on the back of nothing more than a great backstory, a good jawline, and the complete sale of his soul to the MAGA movement. And see, these kinds of jerkwads aren't exactly known for aging gracefully either, so the difference in age between the two of them doesn't really matter. I mean, how could it? They both stopped maturing emotionally at 12 years old. So overall, I feel like all this balances out. Once again, speaking in D&D terms, Matt gets a slight boost to his intelligence for prior experience and formal education, and Madison gets a small boost to his charisma for skipping a few turns and jumping straight to the federal level. Even in their biggest differences, these two somehow come out with more similarities at the end. And that's not even to get into the overt similarities between the two. The thick and overwhelming cloud of sexism that follows both of them. Dim-witted, frat boy attitude pulled from only the worst and most problematic of 80s college comedies. White and wealthy privilege so blatant that every word coming out of their mouths might as well be pre-equipped with an asterisk. And just like Lauren and Marjorie, Matt and Madison are also looking to occupy similar roles to one another in the modern GOP. Fortunately for these boys, though, the Republican Party has always had more seats at the table for loud white guys with poor social skills than it has for anyone else. So while the ladies from last week are playing a vicious game of musical chairs to try and carve out their spot, Matt and Madison just get to sit and enjoy the show from the comfort of their assigned seats. That's why these two are never going to end up in a fist fight. They don't have to. They both stumbled into privileged, comfortable lives as protected members of Congress in a party built almost entirely around people like them. So tell me, where do we go to actually see guys like this for who they truly are? What is the lens through which I can tell these fuckers apart? Well, just one word. Podcasts. Ever since the meteoric rise of noted human hemorrhoid Rush Limbaugh, every underachieving conservative white guy with a painful handshake and too many opinions about immigration has longed for their own radio show. I guess the ability to force everyone to hear their terrible opinions while also simultaneously having the consistent option to hide their face is just too appealing of a prospect for many of them. But it is 2022, and so the radio waves of old have now been slowly replaced by the streaming platforms of new. And with the new tech came a whole slew of new white boy heroes, too. Insufferable blowhards like Joe Rogan, Dennis Prager, and Steven Crowder all arrived to once again reshape the landscape of pointless conservative noise and give lesser men like Matt and Madison a roadmap to true conservative male success. Podcasts also tend to allow folks to garner attention for themselves long after being canceled by the woke mob or whatever it is people like this call it when decent folks get tired of their bullshit. Seeing as both of our guys have pending charges and are generally prone to taking shit way too far on a constant basis, the stability of podcasts is a big bonus when it comes to making sure that they're driving traffic to me and my old videos. Now, in an effort to finish this out and pick a definitive Fundy Friday's Silver Linings champion, I subjected myself to the most recent podcast appearances that both of these men have made at least as of the time of recording. I encourage no one to ever attempt this ever, and I wish I hadn't done it. But now that the trauma's already set in, let me tell you what I learned. First point, Matt Gates just wants to be Tucker Carlson. That's kind of the beginning, middle, and end of it. In my first video covering Matt, I mentioned his podcast, Firebrand, but what I didn't know at the time was the sheer amount of work that he puts into this thing. He's probably put more work into this podcast than he has any single official action he's ever taken as a representative. And watching the show, it's just kind of 
obvious that this is what he really wants his career to be. Now, in addition to his massive number of Spotify uploads, Matt has also been uploading every episode of his podcast to YouTube since August of 2021. And we're not talking about just audio re-uploads either. He records full video, has a standardized thumbnail template, has a slick little countdown timer for his live broadcasts, and boasts a very well done, if not extremely overblown, professional intro. Matt Gates was one of the very few members in the entire Congress who bothered to stand up against permanent Washington on behalf of his constituents. Matt Gates, right now, he's a problem for the Democratic Party, and he could cause a lot of hiccups in passing the laws. So we're going to keep running those stories to keep yeah. hurting him. If you stand for the flag and kneel in prayer, if you want to build America up and not burn her to the ground, then welcome my fellow patriots you are in the right place this is the movement for you you ever watch this guy on television it's like a machine matt gates i'm a canceled man in some corners of the internet many days i'm a marked man in congress a wanted man by the deep state like the Carlsons, Pragers, and Shapiros of the world before him, Matt likes to approach his show with an air of authority that allows him to lend gravitas to bullshit conservative talking points that might otherwise get laughed out of the room. Just like any good lawyer, Matt knows how to pick his words carefully so they don't sound stupid on the first listen. What exactly. a lot of Americans don't see is it's exactly the same people, the deep state operatives who will do a stint at DOJ and then go work for Uber or then go work for Apple or Amazon. And then they exactly. show up in the Biden White House. Then they show up on the Federal Trade Commission. Then they show up on the Federal Election Commission. Then they're back to work at big tech. And there is this revolving door. And I mean, I'll admit. I can kind of see Matt's point there. It does seem that people in these high-level jobs often work across both government and private big tech organizations, and it may not be unreasonable to assume that these folks are involved in very big, very consequential decision-making processes that affect all of us. Now, we all know that that's not what Matt is getting at here, but he's allowed to pretend that it is, and disengaged viewers will be none the wiser. At the end of the day, though, Matt's Achilles' heel is always going to be overconfidence. I can tell you that from one full episode of Firebrand, I know Matt can make himself sound smart, but most of the time, he ends up sounding like this. Dr. Beatty, thank you so much for yet again joining us on Firebrand Live. Um, what is your argument about the American globalist empire and their relationship with wokeness? Seriously, I am begging any one of you in the comments to please explain to me the sentence that just came out of Matt's mouth. I've been trying to figure it out for a week, and all I have to show for my trouble so far is a series of nosebleeds. Now, moving on to Madison, we will see a very different approach to the world of podcasting. At the time of recording, at least, Madison doesn't have his own show or audio program and simply sticks to featuring on other people's platforms. While it's admittedly not as impressive as Matt's full soundstage getup, it certainly does work for people with enough raw charisma to be able to outshine the person sitting across from them. I mean, think about it, if Nikki can build a successful career on the back of a string of incredibly iconic features, then what's to say Madison Cawthorn couldn't do the exact same thing? In terms of actual content, Madison takes much more influence from Rogan than Rush, aiming to sound like a cool conservative buddy rather than an authority on anything. He'll talk about his representative work, the ins and outs of Washington politics, but only in the absolute broadest of terms. The way that Washington works, the way that you start to get bought, uh, the way that you start to lose the power over your vote, is that you start asking leadership, well, hey, what should I do in this situation? I, I don't really understand what this bill is doing. Can you walk me through this? And then all of a sudden they will tell you, oh, well, yeah, you just want to vote for this. And then your voting record starts going down this trail that you don't know, no longer have popular support of the people to support your campaigns. And so then you're starting to have to rely on these special interest groups, these, uh, these super PACs and these, these organizations who want to see their legislation passed, not, not necessarily because it has to do with your district, but because it helps their business. And so these people are called lobbyists. Now, don't think I just sampled from the infamous Orgy cast here, either. Madison was most recently featured on a small program called the Fear Not Do Right podcast. This podcast is hosted by a man named Cade Lamb, who refers to himself as the semi-professional, so you can already tell pretty well they're not aiming for smarts in this one. 
And likewise, Madison does talk about his government work, but only in the broadest strokes. This is one thing I hate about the legislative branch, whether it's in your state governments or your federal government, is you can know what the right move is as a single member of that body. Mm -hmm. You can know what the right move is. You can know what the right thing to do is. You can know what honor demands of you. You can know what your God demands of you. But you can't do it unless you can convince, you know, in Congress it's 217, 218 people. Unless you can convince all of those people, you're not going to be able to accomplish your goal. And so you have to have 51, 50% 50 plus one of the vote to be able to get anything done. And that is, uh, it's a very hard place to be, be in. See, much more of Madison's time on these shows is focused on friendly banter and funny stories as opposed to the nitty gritty of DC life. Shit, there were a couple of moments across these shows that I would even call somewhat charming. And then you're just working to try and keep your position, not actually help the people. I respect all that. Did you just quote Spider-Man? <sighs> the new Tom Holland movie when you had Tobey Maguire and the other Spider-Man, Andrew Garfield, all come out at one time. That's pretty was cool. was freaking sick. That was awesome. And that's, that, that was see, awesome. Th th that's American exceptionalism. But the thing is, this easygoing approach can also have drawbacks for men like Madison. If they get too comfortable, they start saying shit like this. So anyway, so you're in the military currently at... In uh, yes, yes I am. That's fantastic. And now you're also doing the Fear Not Do Right podcast. I, I've got a lot of things. I've got a lot of irons in the fire right now, but this has been the one that has uh, been the most fun, I guess. That's great. So you're killing people for America, and you're also fighting for the culture of America. Well, you know, the infantry is so deadly that they have to be monitored at all times so they don't kill themselves. It's crazy. There's just suicides out the wazoo at Fort Bragg. <laughs> that, is, that is depressing to hear. Now, if you think I'm about to unpack that clusterfuck of a soundbite right now, you got another thing coming. It's late and I want to go to bed eventually. Let's just say it was really good for Madison that he'd already been voted out by the time he dropped that little nugget, because Lord knows he doesn't need it spreading around. And so once again... I find myself at an impasse. On one side, we have Matt, who clearly yearns to jump ship from his boring life in Congress to the glamorous world of conservative TV news. He enjoys slick presentation, an assumption of authority, and a fan base of dedicated followers that consider him the voice of reason in a world con mad. And on the other side, we have Madison, who seems content to survey his options, build connections into conservative media, and just beer bro that got into QAnon over the summer, but still buys beer for you and your friends when he's in town. He's not interested in making conservatism sound smart. He wants to make it sound cool. And in the end, I think this is the best point of separation we've got for these two. While Matt seems to be aiming for the adoration of older conservatives, Madison instead seems to be trying to reach down and pull new conservatives into the fold. He is actively spurning the elitism that Matt built his career on and is instead aiming to be approachable and relatable. Matt wants to grow old with his fan base while Madison wants to grow up with his. And in my opinion, that's where he wins. Matt is more than happy to busy himself with the same old trappings of a dying cable news industry for dying old white men. Whereas Madison has pivoted his strategy towards what seems to be an attempt to bring up the next generation of conservatives in his own image. And it is this new generation Madison is cultivating that I fear will lead him to be the much more influential of these two moving forward. This whole stupid debacle I've been throwing here, as you may recall, is primarily about who's going to get me the most attention. And while Matt may be getting more of the views and search traffic right now, in the end, I don't think he's going to inspire anyone to take their own leap into politics. Madison, though, seems like he probably will at some point inspire a few guys to make that jump, and I think we all know exactly what kind of men those are going to be. That's right, the kinds of men who let me make videos for you wonderful people long into the future. I mean, I mean yeah, okay, it, it's pretty bad for the country and the world and all of the people that live in it. I mean, but I'll be able to turn it into some cash for Fundy Fridays, and and you'll keep getting that good Fundy Fridays content you love for years and years to come. That's that's a worthwhile trade, right? Man, they're both over. I'm wondering if these competitions were a good idea at all. Well, doesn't matter now anyway. The point and the title go to Madison Cawthorn. 
Well, I know it got a little sad and philosophical there at the end, but hey, that's the fight business. And besides, if we're gonna deal with these trash bag politicians, we might as well be allowed to laugh at them, right? Besides, I think we should just let Madison have this one. He's he's lost a lot of stuff recently, and I know the Fundy Friday's Silver Linings Championship is just gonna mean so much to him and his family, you know? Anyways, that's the end of our show for tonight, y'all. Please go ahead and vacate the parking lot now. The Bridge Club ladies have the space next, and you do not want to piss them off. See y'all in October. Whew. All right. Another one in the books. Love these. Uh, that was two of two of the Fundy Friday's Clash of the Clicks update challenge. I'm going to try and keep this brief because I recorded this super late at night and it's kind of creepy around here. Thank you all again, as always, so much for um, being such incredible fans. The Genonites mean the world to us, and I'm still reading through all those kind comments. Last week, Jen really bared her soul for y'all, and you just, you made her feel so good, and that means a lot to me. So uh, I just want to thank all of you. Um, if you like what we do here, please uh, consider consensually smash that like and subscribe button if you really really like it consensually smash that little bell too that way you'll know when Ever we post new content. Um, if you want to support us even more, we have our Patreon, only one tier. It's $3, but right now that gets you access to our awesome Discord, along with monthly patron-exclusive live streams, which have been an absolute blast, let me tell you. Um, we also have merch through our Bonfire store. Please remember, if it's not Bonfire, it's not Real Fundy Fridays. Feel free to follow us on Instagram, TikTok. Other than that, though, I just can't wait to get my Halloween special off the ground for y'all. Thanks so much to you all, to Casetify, to everyone, and I will see you in October. Lord. Oh, these are tiring. Turn that off. Okay. Matt and Madison. What a terrible pair. I hated picking between the two of them. I should have just let the fans vote like Jen said. Neither one of them is that interesting. I really hope I have a good subject for this Halloween special, you know? I just, I'm worried. I'm, I'm worried. I, I don't know. I can't deal with someone like those two. They're not good enough. Well. Hopefully I can find someone who will really bring the scandal. Someone who knows how to creep out a whole world at once. That's what I'm looking for. Maybe I can find him and bring him to Fundy Fridays. But right now, I just gotta go get some sleep. <sighs> Night, Jenna Nights. <laughs> See you next time.